so sometimes during discussion with uh, meat eaters I find that people don't seem to have a very sound understanding of animal experience often people will disregard what level of awareness or experience animals really have at all um, which can be quite a blocker in inviting someone to respect their agency or respect their right to go about life um, without being exploited, without being harmed at all and of course ultimately without being killed See, it's fine if you don't particularly like animals, but you don't need to like animals to respect their right to go about their business without being oppressed by our wants and our hedonistic desires. See, meat consumption isn't always about... Or in fact, in the, it, in the most cases in modern culture, uh, it's not really about survival. More tastes and pleasures and not wanting to adapt. So, I thought today I would have a little look at what animals are really capable of. Who are they? What do they do? How do they experience? Or what can we know? And I'm not just here to give you my opinion, but to give you the opinion of science. So I was reading a interesting article recently, um, which I will take a look at with you. Forgive my puzzling, it has been a long lockdown. Uh, lovely. So we have this nice article here um, called Animal Magic. Some lovely monkeys. And in this, uh, Ross Groves, or Ros Groves rather, talks about um, the ability or, or what we understand about animal emotion in the case of chimpanzees. So she's reflecting on the work of uh, Deval, I don't know what's his first name, oh Professor Franz Deval was the evening speaker, highly renowned for his work as a primatologist and ethologist. Deval is a professor of primate behaviour in the Department of Psychology at Emory University in Atlanta and the director of Living Link Centre at the Yeeks National Primate Research Centre. His work draws parallels between primate and human behaviour in terms of culture, fairness, and harmonious living. So, Ross kind of talks us through uh, the ideas that went on at this talk. It sounds like an interesting talk and it'd be nice to be there. And I just wanted to break down um, some of the categories that he's identified in his work. So, um, as a start point, and then we'll move on to a couple of more famous studies. Or, or one of the discussed ideas is laughter in primates. So in this piece, um, we kind of analyse the existence of laughter in animals, and we just take a look here. Uh, it stated that common to all primates, certain areas of the body, e.g. armpits, sides and belly, are particularly sensitive to touch when being tickled, instantly producing a laughter reaction. Jack Pranskep, 1942 to 2017, even detected rodent laughter through ultrasound when the animal was tickled. To the extent that when we remove his hand, the rat followed, seeking more of the same. He did note, however, that unlike apes and humans, the rodent retained the same facial expression. So, that's quite an interesting observation. Um, laughing is a bonding exercise, there we have evidence of a rodent seeking out a stimulus that makes it laugh, suggesting enjoyment and frivolous entertainment. That's quite uh, sweet and interesting. And perhaps if you're a person who thinks that animals are uh, simple, robotic lumps <laughs> waiting to be life deprived so that you can munch on their flesh, there's obviously something more going on. Um, do chimps have a sense of humour? So in this section, um, this is quite sweet. So chimps do indeed demonstrate a laughter response to unexpected or incongruous events. In one experiment, the researcher wore a panda mask generating a sense of curiosity among a group of chimps. When the mask was removed, however, the chimps unanimously relaxed with laughter. That's beautiful. I, in an observation, a mother chimp when grooming her son 
While he attempted to crack a nut with a tool, she then presented herself to him face to face so that he could reciprocate, and in doing so, stole the tool under his moment of distraction, appearing to guffaw with laughter when doing so. The article goes on to express that they experience other emotions, but I've actually seen, uh, there's a case of a, I think, I think a bonobo, I'll have to check, um, but there is a case of a primate by the name of Coco who has been taught to sign, and by the use of language she's able to, like, she expresses not only laughing, um, but via her language she's been known to crack jokes, including, um, I think some of the things that I've read, she, uh, what, she's been, when posed the question, Coco, what do you think is hard? What's something that's hard? Um, she responded with the sign for a rock, and then also the sign for work. Um, and there's another, I mean, it's not, it's not like she's going to get her own roadshow, but that's a witty, witty joke for a primate. Um, then there's another instant where she tied someone's shoelaces together and then gave them the sign to chase her. So that's quite sweet. Um, and obviously not the behaviour of a simple low functioning machine. Um... I mean, just just at the end of this state, uh, this section here, it states, uh, chimps indulge in a lot of vocalisation when reunited, even after a separation of two or three years. That's beautiful. I mean, it su suggests deep emotional bonds and just expressing that. It's, again, it's clear that their functioning goes beyond what some people might appreciate. So, um, where else do we go on? Primates have a sense of fairness. Uh, we then go on to empathy. Oh, actually the fairness thing is quite sweet. Alongside each other so they can observe the action. Orangutans are well known for... Orangutans are well known to have a strong preference for tastier grapes as opposed to a relatively tasteless cucumber. One orangutan was fed grapes while the other was fed cucumber. Within a short space of time the deprived orangutan showed a reaction of anger even hurling the cucumber back at the experimenter, <laughs> while a strong sense of fairness and equality seeking was being shown by the disadvantaged orangutan in this experiment. The same experiment with chimps showed an even more interesting result in that the chimp who had been fed the grapes on seeing the unfairness of his mate refused to eat any further grapes until his mate received the same treatment, thus showing a strong sense of social justice. That's a absolutely wonderful. I mean, if you ever had a need to extend your altruism for animals, how about that? How about that? They do exhibit altruism. That's inspiring. If only we could all be as nice as chimps and give up a little bit of our taste pleasures so that we can help our fellow beings to live happy lives. Um, in the case of empathy, Duval's explained or so we learned via Ross, um, Duval explains that adult bonobos will rush to comfort a screaming juvenile who has been attacked by another member of the group. The same reaction is commonly seen in young children comforting a crying peer. The exception being a striking absence seen in, for example, Romanian orphans who appear to be distinctly lacking in emotion, regulation and general empathy. Dogs have been seen to yawn <laughs> on hearing yawning sounds from their owners even when they are not directly seen. Reconciliatory behaviour has been observed in wolves, dolphins, hyenas, among other species. However, again, the domestic cat stands out from the crowd as exhibiting no sense of reconciliatory behaviour. It's interesting though, because empathy is one of those ways that we can tell that someone, something is having an experience. You have to have a sense of self in order to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, the empathy of a yawn is something that's so immediate these animals are having experiences. Eventually the video Mama is uh, recommended here, you can see the YouTube details of that. She recommends a box of tissues necessary for viewing. Um, I'll give that a watch, I'll give that a watch. Um, so that's kind of the gist of some of the key points of that article that I wanted to draw out. Now I'm just going to go through a couple of interesting facts that we've learned from other studies. So you may have already heard of this study, um, but there was a great study 
well, it's a very cruel study actually, but very powerful in its findings, um, where rats were given, or rats were placed in cages with no social interactions or anything to really entertain them, and they were given a choice of food that contained heroin, uh, or sometimes uh, methamphetamines, and those rats would become addicted to the drugs and seek comfort in them when they were bored they would start to con they would start to consume more of the foods that contain uh these drugs um but when they were introduced or when they were given a mate and had social interactions and therefore entertainment they chose a social interaction over the drugs um and i just think although or the supposed intention is to teach us something about how to handle drug addiction and helping to get people off drugs and what the true problems are and the causes of this unstimulating cage um, what we learn about rats really for for anyone who doubts the experience of animals what we what we learn about rats is that they are having an experience obviously they're capable of something as advanced as boredom rats are capable of feeling understimulated and so if we're calculating what would be cruel I mean, before you even get into experimentation before you get into the darkness of vivisection um, and the types of ways that they're mutilated and tested upon keeping them in a cage alone is cruel so that's study one study two Dr Skinner uh, discovered that pigeons develop superstitions so uh, so pigeons would uh, perform certain tasks at random and if they were rewarded with food they would start to develop a superstition that this action will cause them to get food or well, that it's lucky um, I can't read their minds <laughs> but those are the findings um, next we have evidence for anyone who doubts that birds suffer and oh boy do we put chickens through some suffering um, there are there are a number of studies actually that demonstrate that pigeons most certainly do suffer. You can take a look at um, a study by uh, Danbury from I think from two thousand. I might have to check this one. I'll put a link any I'll link any studies below um, <clears throat> where broiler chickens uh, broiler chickens are the types of chickens that are reared for eating. So um, in the farming industry, you'll have sort of chickens that are bred that are bred for breeding, chickens that are bred for egg laying, chickens that are bred simply to amass as much meat as possible about their bones as quickly as possible so that essentially to make the industry more efficient they can be killed earlier, they can require less feed in order to uh, to, to bulk up quickly etc. So these these are broilers and broilers, because of the amount of weight that they put on so quickly, they'll often end up lame. Um, and I mean, it, they're, they're essentially they're in so much pain because they've got all this weight about their small young bodies and they're still forming bones um, that they're not really able to move. And movement is difficult for them. If not, um, the weight is paralyzing, and they're on it. They're totally unable to. Um, so given the choice between food that contained painkillers and food that did not contain painkillers, these lame broiler chickens chose the food that contained painkillers, which demonstrates a preference for them not to experience pain, and upon receipt of the painkillers they were more able to move and um, therefore improve their experiences by moving around, which again emphasise their preference for moving when they're able to. Um, which does emphasise the cruelty of keeping pigeon, uh, keep keeping birds, keeping chickens trapped in these restrictive conditions. Uh, next study, study number four. Um, so actually, I was looking at an article specifically called "The Secret Life of Moody Cows," um, but I couldn't seem to find it when get past a paywall. What I did find was another article that referenced it. Um, and that is in animalsaustralia.org. They have published an article, The Secret Lives of Cows. Um, and it's quite interesting. They go through a number of things that have been founded by various studies, which I'll, I'll link that below as well, because it's quite interesting. But essentially, uh, the takeaway from it in their sort of numbered list are that cows have individual personalities, some being um, bold, some being timid, 
and these show from an early age. Another being that cows enjoy solving puzzles and celebrate when they have to do sort of stimulating work where they um, have to think things through, which again is another sad emphasis for why it's so cruel to keep them in conditions where they will be bored. And I know you might think that a lot of cows spend time on pasture and while sometimes that's true, in the case of dairy calves when they are first born they often kept in these really limited tiny pens for the first uh, sometimes months of their life. Um, knowing that cows enjoy stimulation and socialization and in fact they're excited by it just kind of makes you feel there is something very comparable to the human desire to be productive or the the human desire to be amused and entertained or to um, use the brain power that you have available to you and for cows there is again that same drive to use the brain power that is available to them they enjoy solving puzzles and it's cruel to keep them in an unstimulated environment as well as one that's physically limita limiting um, there's another study here which I've not looked into but they reference which says that they have best friends um, they seek out and nurture relationships with other individuals in the herd that's wonderful that <laughs> and they become stressed when separated from their best buddy again I mean we, we see it exhibited that mothers are stressed when um, their calves are removed from them but some people might dismiss that as being simply evolutionary <laughs> Um, but clearly they're just social bonding animals I, I, I feel like you have to go out of your way to deny the evidence here and come to the conclusion that they're not or sometimes when people just say that they're not convinced that that's the case it's like, well, how much convincing do you need? Like, have you set an impossible bar? do you need a cow to communicate with you with words to say, no, I form emotional bonds? Um, I don't know, I, 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 think, I think when people do that they're not really being very honest. It's more a refusal to believe, a refusal to be convinced than an actual reasonable understanding of the evidence. Um, another point on the list is cows have leaders and they have set traits such as intelligence, inquisitiveness, confidence, etc. that mark out good leaders within cow communities, herds if you will, which again emphasises the difference in personalities that they have. There's a leader type cow. The next point on the list is that they're loving and protective mothers and there's, oh gosh, there's a fair bit of research into the types of emotional turmoil that mother cows express when they're separated from their young. Uh, then there's two more points on the list. One is that their young are very playful and cheeky, much like human children are. And the other, that they enjoy music, showing that cows are, um, that cows respond by being calmed by low tempo music. So that's quite beautiful. I'm, I'll link that article underneath as well. That's quite a nice list about cows. Um, in the case of fish, I'd like to throw in the um, worst things happens at sea report as well, just because fish get such a lack of appreciation for the extent to which they suffer. And I think because of, well, because of the nature of what is involved with catching fish and this strange rhetoric that we have that they don't really suffer or that their suffering doesn't matter. It's very much just all about them looking quiet, looking the least like us, <laughs> essentially. Um, we don't really appreciate that they're having experiences or that they can suffer and it's just most obviously the case that they do. So I'll link that article below. It kind of goes into detail about the structure of the fish and there is, um, there is again, similar evidence of them choosing to opting for food that contains painkillers when they're suffering, which clearly shows a preference not to suffer. It's really quite easy to measure these things. It's strange that people remain in denial about the experiences of fish. If you're the sort of person that thinks you're doing less harm by consuming fish, then you ought to consider that the reasonable, or the most reasonable estimate that we have of wild fish being caught or the number of wild fish being caught per year is at a low estimate one trillion fish being caught um, and the practices that go into catching fish are absolutely abhorrent I mean if you think about the sorts of standards that you see in in the case of uh, farming of land animals we generally look at that footage and, and say oh it's quite shockingly brutal a lot of people kind of keep an out of sight, out of mind approach, but when they see it happening, they can see that it's brutal. Even 
though we have practices in place such as stunning an animal, shooting a bolt into the brain, often it's required that the animal is unconscious when they are killed, even though that's not always achievable and it's still so barbaric. Often um, it will be required that the death is more instantaneous, which um, again not always achieved and still brutal. <laughs> But in the case of fish, we have fish on lines in trawlers struggling and suffocating for hours and hours at times. We use live fish as bait. So we hook a live fish and throw them into water and leave them hanging there for hours. Another fish will be caught and again hang for hours. And then they'll be hauled out of the water, injured and suffocate in unbreathable atmosphere, all while completely destroying the ocean, in which over the course of 30 years, 50% of the coral reef has been destroyed. The situation with fishing is a tangent in this discussion, but it's paramount that we stop. And I mean, if you think the amount of plastic that ends up in the ocean as a result of trawlers, it's just, it's inexcusable. If you think that the, that fish is a lesser of any kind of evil, it's absolutely not. It's, hu it's humans at their most barbaric. Anyway, the next that I'll share is um, evidence of complexity of animal language. So this has been found with a number of animals, but I'll share some findings about crow language because they actually have quite um, a complicated vocal system, giving uh, different types of calls when they're around food, etc. But again, there's sort of limited, there's a limit to what we can know about these kinds of things because um, we don't speak the language, we just observe um, different behaviour. I mean, the same thing's been found in different animals. I think there's been, um, I remember seeing a study where chickens are found to have different responses to um, predator warnings, whether it's like a ground predator or a sky predator, etc. There's not, there's an obviously more advanced vocal system for a lot of animals than we really perceive. It's not just making noise, they are communicating, and sometimes they're communicating specific information obviously fire a less complex structure than ours, but it's more complex than we appreciate. And then there are other fun observations such as, quite charmingly, there is a study which found that bees were capable of pessimism, which is um, really quite groundbreaking given that they are invertebrates and therefore one of the most contestable for displaying a larger emotional range or experience. But there we have it. There's a handful of studies and I'll link the details for all of them below, but just if you're a person who doubts the experience of animals, there's sufficient evidence that they are experiencing and that they are far more complicated than you might appreciate. And whether they be expressing superstition, pessimism, bonding, communication, um, experience of pain, enjoyment of puzzles, Whatever it may be, it's reasonable to assume that if they experience any of those things, they experience a desire not to suffer, and they experience some sort of lust to live. If rats can be bored, then most definitely cows and chickens and pigs and sheep, fish, can hurt, can suffer emotionally and physically, and desire to live. So maybe let's leave them alone. Hey. That's what we're proposing.